So good morning, everybody. My name is Alicia Zeman, and I am the coordinator for the West Virginia PBIS project. We, it is 11 a.m., and we are going to go ahead and get started. So uh, Dr. Harris has all the time he needs to go through his presentation. As you know, the PBIS um, project is part of the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. And the TA Center is a collaboration between West Virginia Autism Training Center at Marshall University and the West Virginia Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Student Support. Uh, we house three projects for the state of West Virginia. We house um, the school-wide PBIS program, the Early Childhood PBIS program, and Youth Mental Health First Aid. Um, in response to the COVID crisis, we had to cancel our annual PBIS conference, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to get resources out to our educators in the state of West Virginia. And many of our presenters have agreed to um, present in this format, and we're so excited about being able to bring this to you. Just a few things. Um, we're going to keep everybody on mute, um, but the chat box is open for questions. We are on a quick time frame, so we're not sure if we will be able to answer questions at the end. But at the end of this, um, this webinar, there will be a link for you to sign in. It has been requested by counties that we have a way to show um, who attended our webinars. So that link will take you into a sign-in process. And at the bottom of that um, sign-in, you can put any questions that you might have um, for Jim to answer in, in the future. Um, also, we are excited about being able to bring this to you. And so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our presenter. He was scheduled to be our keynote speaker um, for the conference, but he has agreed to be our featured speaker for the and kick off our webinar series. Um, Dr. Jim Harris is the Associate Director at the West Virginia Autism Training Center at Marshall University. Jim's focus at the West Virginia ATC is the improvement and expansion of services ranging from in-home programs to national partnerships. He has worked with a variety of public and private entities, including the Fred Rogers Company, the United States Department of Education, and the United States Department of Justice and many more. And we're excited to hear what he has to share with us about um, PBIS and how we can expand it in, in our future work. So, is he there? Yeah, I'm here. You there, Alicia? I'm here, you're okay. good to go. You glitched out there for a second and I thought, oh no, not good. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, Alicia. Um, Wow, what a, what a great opportunity. We're making the best out of the circumstances that we're in. Um, I appreciate that. Man, I tell you what, our team with uh, the Behavioral Mental Health Technical Assistance Center is, is absolutely outstanding. Um, I can't say enough about um, really just what they get done, uh, the work they get done. The, the, uh, we've, in April, you guys know, we had a webinar series that was released that went fantastic, had great participation. We, we anticipate the exact same thing occurring uh, with this webinar series. Um, I'm just really, really proud of what Amy Kelly, um, our coordinators, Alicia Zeman, and um, Amy Carlson, and our behavior sports specialist with uh, Terrell Jones, and we've also got uh, Tiffany Hendershot and Jen Everhart, um, and we're currently going to be filling, uh, replacing Alicia in the north. So, uh, in, in our mental health first aid work uh, with uh, Diana Bailey Miller, we're just really, really, really proud of the work that our behavior mental health technical assistance does, and we're really proud uh, that the Department of Education has put such an investment in us uh, to carry out the work that we do. So. Today, um, I'm going to talk about um, this concept of, uh, it's kind of a joking title, but it's, it's serious when we start talking about how hard it is to implement PBIS with fidelity. And, and I, want to, I want to say that right out of the gate because, um, you know, there's a lot of things out there that are sold as quick fixes to complicated problems. And, and at least in my experience professionally, I've found that anybody that tries to sell you a quick fix to a complicated problem 
Um, they're probably misleading you. They don't, or they don't understand the problem uh, in, at, a, at an in-depth way. So what we're going to talk about today is more than posters and parties and fidelity and expansion with PBIS. And the reason why I titled it more than posters and parties is because sometimes it tends when in the implementation of PBIS in schools that folks, um, that those are the things that seem to get put in first or it's the things that seem to be left over when folks kind of slide off the implementation trail. So what we're going to talk a lot about today is fidelity, what things that uh, folks might struggle with and how to get those things back on track. We're also going to talk a little bit about perspective and mind shift and things like that. So um, I'm excited to kind of dig in. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about why PBIS, uh, because we all know that the, the social emotional needs of students today um, are significant. We know that children are existing in a very complicated society. Um, they're existing in a society that um, has very complicated decision making, uh, very high stakes when we look at things like substance exposure, trauma, uh, substance uh, use disorders, all these different things that make the world pretty, a pretty complicated place for kids to live. More complicated than us growing up, I would argue. Um, you know, with internet and Instagram and social media and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of factors that um, affect the way a child exists in society today. So we know that, that our kids in society today, um, the needs are higher. And we see those needs and the manifestation of issues with behavioral issues, decision-making issues, um, and, and how those things affect the outcomes of, of different individuals' lives. So what I'm wanna, but and, and now, of course, now we've got not only um, uh, did we have those natural trends that were, or those trends that were occurring already, but now, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about the pandemic, but now this has added a whole nother layer to the complications of supporting young people, of developing them social and emotionally, dealing with things, stress, anxiety, trauma, those kinds of things. You know, one of the big things, I've, I've, I did a self-care uh, conversation a couple weeks ago, and, and one of the things we were talking about is, you know, stress is anything that disrupts homeostasis. And remember back from freshman biology, homeostasis is when a system is in balance. So stress is anything that knocks the system out of balance. Well, obviously, COVID-19 has been a stressor. And anxiety is fear of the unknown, of what might happen. So obviously COVID-19 has introduced a, a, a ton of anxiety because even today we don't know a lot of what's going to happen. We don't know, um, you know, what the fall is going to look like. We don't know what July is going to look like, you know, and our kids, there's so much uncertainty. So right now you take those existing issues of social emotional development and then complicate those with stress and anxiety that COVID-19 has now presented. And it's really put us in a tough spot. And, and the, the, what I'm going to try to do is, is this, I can't just make this a, a uh, June 2nd talk. It needs to be a talk in general about what we need from a positive behavior support structure when we're implementing in schools and what things to consider. But I do think there is a natural reaction when we find ourselves in high anxiety, high stress situations is that we just want stuff to do. It's like, just give me strategies. Uh, we see that a lot with our trainings and technical assistant requests. Um, when it comes to uh, folks uh, sending in, uh, you know, I need tier three trainings. We need FBA, FBA, BIP trainings. Um, but what we, what one of the things I think we've got to really think about is we've got to be thoughtful in our action, thoughtful in our strategies, because movement isn't always effective. You can be busy and unproductive. So what we want to, what I like to talk to folks about when we really start looking at what, how strategies work or or how to choose our strategies is. We have to take a couple steps back and consider what makes a strategy effective in a lot of ways. And what makes strategies effective in a lot of ways, the first part, part is the state of the individual or group implementing the strategy. State is things like your psychological functioning, your physical functioning, um, you know, your emotional functioning, those kinds of things. If I have a person, um, you know, a, for example, implementing a strategy, uh, if I have a person who was like, they're trying to improve their health, but their mother was just diagnosed with cancer and they're at the hospital multiple hours of a, a day and they're having to take care of the mother's dog or whatever it might be, they're not going to be in a state because of the, the emotional unrest, the physical unrest to implement whatever strategies, typically speaking. So we're looking at teachers and educational professionals 
uh, parents even, you know, one of the things we have to take into consideration is how, what kind of state are we in? Are we taking care of ourselves? Our technical assistance center has a lot of content on self-care uh, strategies and stress and burnout and those kinds of things. So, and that's not the nature of this talk, but I want to mention that. What state are we in? Second is what story are we telling ourselves about the problem or situation? I'm going to talk about that more in just a second, but an example of that might be, let's say you've got somebody who has a child with autism in their class, but let's say it's a child who's pretty verbal um, and, and doesn't present somewhat typical uh, as a, a significantly affected individual with autism. But um, one of the things that, that we find is this student would really respond well to a visual, visual schedule. Well, the visual schedule is the strategy, but let's say just for the sake of discussion, that that teacher says, well, I don't, I, he, he, the kid's having trouble transitioning. So he's, he's melting down before transition. And our deduction is he's having trouble with the, with the mental shift from executive functioning issues. The, the, uh, uh, the visual schedule would help him to prepare mentally, physically, and emotionally for that transition. But let's say we've got a teacher who says, you know, I just think he's spoiled. I think no one's ever told him no. I, don't, I think no one's ever told him he has to do something else. And that's why he's melting down. If I give that teacher that visual schedule, her story is not going to match my strategy. So she's not going to use that strategy. He or she's not going to use that strategy because the story in their head is he's spoiled, not this kid has a neurodevelopmental disorder that impacts his ability to transition from one activity to another because of his executive functioning. So we really got to spend some time, and I think this is the tough part that gets hard when we start talking about professional development. We need to spend more time talking through the stories that people have about kids and what they need today. Uh, we talk a lot about mind shift training in the Technical Assistance Center, you know, helping that, that, that system that is the school of professionals, that system of professionals and, and paraprofessionals have a similar mind um, or perspective or story about what kids need in that building. And if we can get that alignment in place, it really does help tremendously. So one of the things I think we can do a better job of sometimes is before we start handing out strategies, before we start buying curriculum and that kind of stuff, is spending more time uh, talking about what the stories that we're telling ourselves in our head. And what I found, um, you know, I used to have a little bit more of a confrontational thought about that, but I found that people are doing the best, oftentimes, most of the time, people are doing the best they can with what they know. And the worst way, to get people to um, consider your perspective is to shame theirs. So I think we have to, we need to spend more time. And I, if you haven't had a chance, there's some great research out there. And I'll talk more about this later or, or uh, content out there about uh, change theory, the trans theoretical stages of change. And the book is called changing for good, or their first book is called changing for good. There's another one called changing to thrive or Thri changing to thrive, but it talks about how different people are at different places in their change process. And if you're a change agent, you're someone who's trying to, to create change in a system, your ability to assess um, a person's stage of change and then give them the, the specific um, support that they need to move through the change process based on where they are is going to directly correlate with your ability to be effective in being a change agent. If you don't, what you're going to do is get a lot of mismatch. So you're going to have someone who doesn't even think they have a problem and you're trying to make them change their problem and you're going to create dichotomy and resistance. But anyways, so one, one of the places I like to start is a general discussion around why uh, the, uh, the story we tell ourselves about kids is this idea of what's wrong with kids these days versus what do kids need today. Now, think about these two phrases and how different they, they, uh, they present. If I say what's wrong with kids these days, the, in, the inference in that question is there's something wrong with kids. And that creates an us versus them mentality when it comes to working with kids. So what? imagine this. If you go home and your significant other's at the house and, uh, or, and you walk in and your significant other looks at you and says, I'm glad you're home. I've been thinking all day and I figured out what's wrong with you. And think about your initial emotional reaction to someone saying that to you. I doubt it's going to be, well, let me go get some coffee. And I'd love to sit down and hear all the things you found that are wrong with me and how I can improve to make a, to be a better person in your eyes. You're going to become confrontational. You're going to be taken back. You're going to have all these things. And, and, and it's, a, it's a me versus you kind of mentality. But when I say, what do kids need these days? Now we've changed our perspective. Now we've changed the way we're going about it. Now it's not me versus kids, which when I listen to people talk, I can hear that all the time. Me, it's them versus kids. Kids are spoiled. They're lazy. They're whatever, right? 
But what do kids need today? Let's say I do have a kid that's lazy. Then that kid needs help with motivation, needs help with goal setting. He doesn't need to just be told he's lazy because all that does is create that, that lockup again. But if I have what the kids need today, now what I'm doing is I'm standing alongside kids, looking into the world, preparing that kid to get ready to go into the world. And I had the same approach with my own kids. These are my boys, uh, Jake and Cody. Um, they're much bigger than this now. But they're not as cute, so I like to use old pictures of them. Um, so, <laughs> the, uh, so this is a, this is Jake. And the thing about Jake and Cody is if, if, you're, if any of you have ever had uh, your kids say, uh, if you're a parent and you haven't had your kids say this to you, I, I'm, I would question you significantly. But um, my, my oldest son, who's 13, the other day wanted to go do something with his buddies, but he didn't have his chores done. And I said, I said he couldn't go. And uh, so he says, Dad, you're mean. And I said, uh, well, I see that you're disappointed trying to be uh, as counselor as I could be or therapist as I could be. And I said, but son, you, you seem to be confused. And he goes, what's that? And I said, well, my goal in raising you is not the main goal of me raising you is not for you to have a happy childhood. And, and Jacob looks at me, kind of his head's taken back. And he can tell I'm kind of messing with him. And he yells into my wife, who happens to be an elementary school principal, and says, mom, dad, what doesn't want us to have a happy childhood? And my wife, understanding the context of our discussion, yells back, "Me neither." So, <laughs> what we're what, the reason why we did what and, and what I said to him, and, and you know, kind of you know, in a joking way, is, "Listen, buddy, there's times I'm going. You're going to have to be disappointed as a kid in order for me to help you be a better adult because you need to learn responsibility." So, one of the things I think is easy, even if you have that old school person who's like, "Kids need to talk." Everybody can get on board with the goal with kids is to raise functional adults. That's what we're working toward, is to raise kids who can engage and enjoy society and contribute. And what that means is we have to look at what they need. And I know, it's like, well, I know from my experience and my read that shame and an adversarial approach is not effective in building the psychology of a human being. So what we have to consider is, what do kids need today? And what do we do to develop that? Now, we start going into this idea. Now, what are we going to do about it, Jim? All right, I'll, we're on board. All of us, we had a staff meeting. We've all decided we want to help raise functional adults in our house. Now, let me make something real quick, or in our school. Let me make something real clear, though. When I said I don't want my kids to have a type of childhood, I'm, somebody might be saying, he, he, you know, that's mean or whatever. No, here's – we have a great time at our house. We have a great time with our kids. But I understand that sometimes my – kids are going to have to be uncomfortable in order to be prepared to be comfortable, to be uncomfortable and move toward comfortable as an adult, to build their own psychology, to build their own capacity. So, um, but I know that kids that are better at delaying gratification, problem solving, have a better shot at being happy as an adult and being better moms, better dads and things like that. So now what are we going to do about it? Now, this is where it, we, we, we spend some time on the story side. Okay. We got to figure out how we think about kids. Now we start working into this idea and I talk about this you know for every complex problem it's kind of what I lead off with there's an answer that is clear simple and wrong now I'm gonna this next time I have a real disclaimer a natural reaction is we have kids with more needs our kids are the needs of our students are higher okay where we got social emotional needs all these kinds of things and immediately people go we got to hire more people we got to get more people now I've got nothing wrong with improving ratios. I've got, no, I'm a social worker by trade. I have nothing wrong with saying, let's get social workers in schools. Let's get therapists in schools. Let's get counselors in schools. Let's get all, I love that. I think that's fantastic. But one of the things I always want people to think about is you will not hire or purchase your way out of ineffective systems. Let me give you an example. You have a school who hires a social worker but they don't change anything about behavior support systems. And this social worker becomes the person that the principal can just send all quote unquote, those kids to and deal with things like, um, you know, home visit type stuff and food issues and connection to service. And listen, that social worker is going to be effective and going to help that school. But what if that social worker is a part of a system, a multi-tiered system that has data systems that identify students based on the things that the team has decided upon and they're, we're meeting as a team, we're collaborating, we're identifying students based on unified needs, we're doing focused skill groups, we're connecting with community resources uh, for tier two uh, supports and tier three supports and that social worker now becomes 
part of an, a better system. Because in that first model, if that if the principal in that building is still heavily dependent upon exclusionary practices like detention and, and, and suspension and all that, that social worker will immediately become a firefighter. And they're going to spend all their time putting out fires. Even when, even in the best of circumstances, a social worker will be a firefighter in some regard, but better systems help to prevent that. So we got to be careful about, or purchasing. You know, I've worked with schools that have tons, or counties that have tons of money. They have all kinds of money because of different socioeconomic circumstances in their county. But, but what we find is, and look like, for example, second step. Second step is a uh, evidence-based approach that we can use for social emotional instruction, Right. But just because a county says we have X hundred thousands of dollars, we're going to go buy every teacher's second step. Anybody that's spent any time in education knows that's a fantastic way to get a bunch of second step programs stuck on shelves and never be used. Because we didn't plug second step into a system. We didn't say, we didn't talk to people and say, what do you need? And then we didn't talk to them and say, here might be some things where I think second step, whatever curriculum, curriculum we want to throw in there. Uh, could be helpful in this specific need that we have in our building. So really important for our administrators, our county level administrators. I said this to superintendents earlier in the year, you're not going to hire or purchase your way out of ineffective systems. Now you got good systems and you do smart hiring and you do smart purchasing, it will bolster your systems. And so we have that that we have to keep in mind. And then also one of the things we have to be careful of in responding to the needs of students these days. And this is something we got to be, and we felt this even at the TA center. There were so many webinars, so many uh, um, uh, uh, quick reference sheets. There were so many COVID everything uh, that we all, I mean, it was, it's exhaust, it was exhausting uh, because there was so much stuff. Um, it, was, it, it was overwhelming. So too much of a good thing is still too much. And we have schools. I've had schools ask me before, uh, Jim, we're going to do Leader and Me. We're going to do PBIS. We're going to do, uh, you know, all these different things. Um, and what happens is they end up trying to do too much at once and they don't implement anything well. So we, we, it's better to do a few things well than do a bunch of things in a mediocre fashion. So you might, and one of the things we do in our academies with schools is we have them to look through what they're already implementing and then talk about what they can get rid of or what they need to get rid of if they're going to have the energy left over to uh, implement uh, PBIS. So let's say I've had this whole conversation. You're like, Jim, we're sold. We want PBIS. We want to, we're, we're, we're excited about it. We want to partner with the TA center. Um, we're, we're off to see the center. We want to, we want to come, we want to come work with you guys. And then we're going to come to the academies and then you come to our academies and we show you our fancy pyramid, right? We show you our fancy triangle. We tell you about George Seagal. We tell you about Don Kincaid. We tell you about all these awesome people have been doing us tons of research since early late 1990s and early two thousands. We tell you all these outcomes and you're, you're on it and you're sold. And we show you about these multi-tiered systems. It, it, the academies to us is just the introduction to the work. Uh, it's just getting started. Um, it's, uh, for lack of better terms, it's kind of the, the, the boot camp, so to speak. It's just where you start learning the basic stuff. Um, it, 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 it's important but it's not the completion. So we in this, we talk about, we take you through the tiered fidelity inventory. We have taken great caution and intention, and we've built everything on a national model. Um, you know, uh, I was PBIS coordinator initially, and then Amy Kelly came in and took it to a whole nother level, and I have no doubt whatsoever Alicia Zim is going to do the exact same thing coming up. But everything we're built, we're not just sitting around in, at Marshall coming up with this stuff. We're collaborating with national partners to say, what's the evidence tell us is going to work? What's, what's going to happen, right? So we look at these essential features, and these are those things that our whole academy is based on. These are the, the tiered fidelity inventory. And if you don't know what that is and you're, and you're trying to implement, that's, that might be an area why you're really struggling because this is the bones of what you should be doing. So we go in and we talk about that tiered fidelity inventory. We talk about those essential features. And then we talk about the outcomes. There's tons and tons of outcomes. Don't take my word for it. Um, get, on, get on academic journals. Get on pbis.org. Read the research. Um, there isn't a, a, a behavior support system approach that has more evidence behind it than possible behavior support. I wrote my dissertation on it, spent a bunch of time flipping all the rocks I could find, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what is a behavior support system, what isn't a behavior support system. And uh, PBIS just came out clearly. Now, this is what happens that gets dangerous. 
is we sometimes what will happen is we'll get to the what I call the golden corral approach. It's, it's like kind of makes me sad because I all the golden corrals are closed down, and my boys and I love golden corral. Uh, my wife not as big a fan. Uh, we have to do guys night. Usually if there's a new movie out, like a, a superhero movie, something we'll, we'll go see a superhero movie, but we'll go out to eat at golden corral. And I'm certain right now that there's somebody it's okay to judge me. Uh, we, we love golden corral in our family, but just cause everybody can eat whatever they want. But when you think about the golden corral approach, it's you get your plate and you pick what you like. And if we, if what I've found is some of the schools that have struggled have kind of had this golden corral perspective to these essential features. They pick the ones, and it's, let me tell you, and this isn't uh, because of fault in anybody. This is because um, it's sometimes those are the easier things to start with. And we start talking about, when I say like more than posters and parties, but what, I, what I mean by more than posters and parties is the easy things to start with for a lot of people are the posters or scheduling reward parties. All right, nine weeks, or they might already have them. We already have nine weeks parties. That's awesome. We'll keep doing that. Or the posters are, and let me, let me tell you what can, in fairness to people, how that can happen. You get excited. You're at the academy. You want to get started, right? Let's do something. We've got our expectations. I know a guy that makes vinyl banners. Let's call that guy. I think I can get us some banners put together, right? Or I've got a great idea for a party. So they have that initial part, which is you've got that excitement, right? And then also what people might have is they might already have some things in place. They might already have some expectations from like a previous program or from um, safe. Uh, oh, shoot. I can remember the old uh, respect and protect or safe and supportive schools or whatever those kinds of things might be. They might have that kind of thing already in place. So they start getting in there. Or, and the last one is a common one we run into, and this isn't a fault on counties, but Sometimes what happens is you have the county system is, is strongly encouraging a school to participate. So they'll say, you need to go to this academy because of X, Y, Z indicators you have in your school. So what happens is the county is supporting them and going to uh, the academy, but that support can feel like pressure. So there's this expectation of we got to get moving. We got to hurry up. And then sometimes, uh, and that's why we continue to work hard with central offices, is to help people understand, don't push things like banners, don't push things like parties, if your school's not ready to go there yet. So those are some of the dynamics that can come in, because if we don't have, and if someone use my, uh, my I speak in hillbillyisms, because it's when my brain works sometimes, um, you know, if my dad used to say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And what that means is, there are certain qualities that make a duck a duck. And there's certain, if you have a duck, there's certain behavioral expectations and abilities you expect that duck to have. I believe that if I put a duck in a pond, it's going to be all right because the duck qualities that it has makes it capable of living in that environment. Now, at the risk of sounding, however, uh, you take a chicken and you drop a chicken in the pond, it's not going to fare so well. because Now, you might look at it and say, it's a bird, it's got a beak, it's got feet, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't have the specific qualities to get those specific outcomes. Um, so, and it's not going to fare well for the chicken. So we have to really think about, we've got to have these essential features because if we have these essential features, those are going to be the things that then will produce these outcomes in the re that the research has taught us, right? We're going to uh, decrease our disciplinary problems. We're going to improve our climate. We're going to uh, decrease bullying. We're going to see an increase in our academic achievement, but we got to make sure we've got those duck-like qualities in place. And positive behavior support really is a different way of looking at behavior support. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And the main change we find in positive behavior support, and this is kind of the, the not so well kept secret about positive behavior support. The real shift of the positive behavior support is not the focus on student behavior, but the focus on adult behavior. So we're changing where the point of intervention is. We're not talking about student support. We're talking about adult behavior, or not we're talking about changing student behavior, fixing kids. We're talking about improving the environments in which kids live in. We're talking about not admiring our problems, but solving our problems, creating systems for those types of things. You know, we talk about this a lot. You know, if you're if we're sitting in a meeting just complaining about kids, we're admiring our problems. We're comparing. Well, our county's got more of this than this county, and where are the poor. I mean, I've, I've I've been in meetings sometimes where people were almost competing for social ills, 
But okay, now what? Solving problems is how we do that. Now, the two foundational behavioral questions I love that I, that guide uh, the PBIS conversation is this concept of we, what do we change about the environment and what do we do for skill development? How do we make environments a place where kids are more likely to be successful? And how do we build skills where kids are more likely to be successful? So those are those guiding. That's what the PBIS system is always trying to look at, trying to find, trying to problem solve. Environmental change, skill development. Environmental change, skill development. And we create these systems that then are responsive to the needs that our students have. So the last, the, 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 the rest of the presentation, we'll talk about five common fidelity struggles. So these are the five real common things we see when we go into schools is we see struggles with these things more than others. And I, I love this quote, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Now, in defense for why these are common fidelity struggles is because they're the hard, they're the hard things to keep going because they have the most long-term effort involved because it, it's, you know, anybody can eat good for a week, right? But it's, can you eat good for, can you eat well for six weeks, 12 weeks, you know, 36, you know, that when you start looking at it, that's why these things are hard. Teaming's hard, right? Data systems are hard. Professional development, doing it right, not, not one shot run off. Uh, teaching systems are hard. Reinforcement and feedback systems are hard, right? So let's talk about this first one, teaming. I have found in my experience that Teaming is a, is a good indicator of how effective that school is at solving problems in general, okay? So what I mean by that is a lot of schools that are really good problem-solving schools are good at teaming because they're good at getting people together, identifying problems, brainstorming solutions, executing, outcome, or executing plans. And that, doesn't mean, and that can be in reading instruction, behavior support, whatever, uh, good teaming and, and, and what you find, one of the, one of the things we found is that, that what is a big hindrance for teaming are teams that, uh, are inefficient. Um, they, 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 people show up late. People, uh, talk about their kid's soccer game. Um, the, the principal likes to tell stories for the first 20 minutes of every meeting. Um, Programs, school places that struggle with teaming typically have some of the they, – they're not effective and efficient in their teaming. But we start looking at things like uh, – there's a few things just to point out. Representative group, do, have we looked at, the, at, our, at our faculty, our staff, and said, do we have the people that we need? You know, or do we have just the people that volunteer for everything? You know, do we have people um, like paraprofessionals? Do we have our administrative support? Do we have uh, grade level representation, special education representation? These types of things. Do we have community partners that are part of this? Our social worker, our counselor, whomever. These kinds of folks, are they involved? Are we meeting at least monthly? We have a lot of schools that meet more than monthly. We found that you can't you can't meet less than monthly a lot of times and continue to gain to keep the momentum. One of the things we'll look at with a team is say, show me the agenda for your upcoming meeting or your last meeting, and show me minutes because what that is an indicator, not a deal, an indicator uh, that that team um, is uh, focused and efficient. Um, and and so you look at that agenda, you look at those minutes and the action plan. What are you working on right now? If you've got a strong PBIS team, I'd argue team in general, but a strong PBIS team, and we ask your team leader, ask your team to sit down and say, what are you working on right now? Bam, bam, bam. Should be able to say it. Why? Because that's the, the that's what's moving that, the, that plan or that process or that implementation forward. And what you'll find with schools that are struggling is they'll say, you know what? We came back from the academy, you know, use our academies. Um, I think I'm on this one, right? It's my months are getting messed up. September, October, November. And what you'll find sometimes is people will um, have that November Academy and then they won't meet December. They won't, won't meet January. They won't meet um, February. And then they start talking about, oh, we got to get together. And then testing windows come up. And next thing you know, it's late March, early April. And they haven't met formally since November. And it's, 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 it's no wonder they're struggling because they haven't got a chance to sit down and meet. But if you are one of those teams, if you are one of those schools that have done that before, there's no need in beating yourself up about it. You just got to get back on the horse. You got to get back into what it is and say, what was it about that that kept us? Did we not skip, Did we not have a standard day of the month? Did we not have the right people on the team? Um, are we just struggling at teaming in general? The second thing I want to talk about is data systems. Now, this is one of the hardest things because it, it requires 
um, a lot of consistent work and some people who are specifically responsible for it. So some of the data systems I'm going to talk about are tracking antisocial discipline strategies, office discipline referrals, reinforcement data, and things like that. But I'll start here because I'm going to go through each one. Antisocial discipline data. This is a place I usually encourage schools to start because it's one of the most detrimental things to student uh, outcomes. Um, the overuse of timeout and detention, the overuse of suspension and expulsion, the overuse of exclusion from activities such as reteach rooms. And a lot of times people say, well, we have a reteach room. And listen, I, I'd rather have a reteach room than a detention room. But typically when I'm in a reteach room, I'm removed from standard programming. So ultimately what my reteach room should be doing is uh, decreasing the need for reteach because I'm building skills and capacity. Now, that, that, you know, we have kids that need a lot of reteach, and that's fine, but just tracking uh, how effective that, that intervention is, or standing on the wall at recess, which is a tough one for me sometimes because kids need to move. But really looking at how dependent is that school on uh, these antisocial discipline, data, discipline strategies, because here's one of the things. If we want pro-social students, which means students who are – good at socialization, but we use antisocial discipline strategies as our primary intervention. We are, just by clear semantics, we are working against ourselves. Removal does not create skill. So now, are there some kids that are, that are so uncomfortable in an antisocial situation, such as timeout and detention, that they will uh, make the decision to improve behavior in the future? Yes, but I would argue that isolation is not, uh, it is a weak strategy because it commonly lacks skill development. It lacks the addition. So if that's a good place for a school to start, if they're struggling with discipline referrals, if they're struggling at least be tracking when kids are, are, are being removed from program um, office discipline referrals. It's a big one. Um, you know, tracking all these different levels, who, what, when, where, how often, where is it happening? Bringing a level of precision uh, to your behavior support systems. You know, I, I, when you have good discipline data, and excuse my excuse the the firearm example of it, but you know if you don't have good discipline data, you're going to have a shotgun approach. You're going to aim in a general direction and hope you hit something. But when you have good data, you can use a rifle type approach. You can use that precision of that's what I'm trying to hit. Uh, the hallway before eight o'clock every morning is where we got to increase supervision, right? As opposed to we've got kids fighting more now. Then, you know, we, we got to figure out precision and how that stuff fits in. And it, there's tons of resources and supports uh, that we have for that. Feedback and reinforcement data. This is one that um, I've seen some schools really do some neat stuff with this, where they have, like, caught you systems, where, you know, a kid gets caught being, let's say, just use the generic example, be safe, be respectful, be responsible, or doing their best, one of those four, right? If they can't, the teacher will have – uh, an acknowledgement where they can write on, you know, the, the kid's name, circle which one of the expectations they met, met and sign their name. And what the, what the administrator did with that, which I thought was fantastic, is that administrator would then have someone analyze that data that would tell them what kids are being reinforced, what are they getting reinforced for, and who are the teachers that are reinforcing kids. And one of the things that this principal found, this administrator found, is commonly the people that complain the most about kids were the people that were the least likely to reinforce, the least likely to acknowledge, the least likely to give feedback. They just wanted to sit in the hallway with their arms folded and kids should do what they should do. But really helping make sure that, and we talk about access to the feedback and reinforcement system, are, are all of our students having access to feedback and reinforcement? Because we do a pretty good job sometimes of everybody having access to punishment if needed, but are we getting kids access to feedback and reinforcement systems? So that's just something to think about as another data system you can consider. Um, the last one I'll mention is, you know, community data systems. This is one of the things that I really feel like social workers, counselors, folks like that can be really, really helpful. And, you know, you're, you should not have just an anecdotal understanding of your community data, but you should have someone who is sharing with your team and staff specifics about the community data. What is our SES trends? What is our free and reduced lunch ratio? What is our poverty rate? What, in my mind, I think making people more informed in that would be essential. Look, looking at family structure, what's our kinship care ratio? Because what happens is people just piggyback on what they think, what they see. Now, oh yeah, we got tons of grandparents raising their kids. Well, what is a ton? What's tons? How many? What percentage? 
uh, as best as we can measure. Because then that makes people, it gives you more of a foundation of understanding of what the needs might be. Cultural data, you know, looking at things like, uh, and again, these things can get tricky a little bit, but but just knowing like what's the what's the faith based uh, uh, landscape in our environment? Um, you know, how many churches do we have? What kind of supports those churches have? Moving into like community services, what are the community services we had? I worked with a county a while back, man. I really loved uh, what they did. It was actually I'll say because it's a positive thing. I'll, I'll say it. Um, it was in Randolph County, and I want to say it was either middle school or high school, but they had a uh, local domestic violence uh, organization, domestic violence prevention organization that had a grant and part of their grant was to give to do professional development or to do groups with teenagers about um, relationship violence perfect come to our school you can work teach our kids about relationship violence I don't have to hire a person or take time away from my counselor that's understanding how community services uh, factor into that the third one is when we start talking about is professional development now a lot of people might think Oh, we got this one nailed in PBIS. I mean, we 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 did the training. We went to the academy, and then we came back, and we did an all-staff training. We told people how awesome it was, and we showed them our posters. And so we we checked that box. I'm, I'm going to challenge our thinking about what professional development looks like as a system, not as an event, but as a system. So the first place you start with professional development is how about your ducks? How about your ducks? Do you understand? PBIS at the level to where you can confidently stand in front of other people and talk about it. Because I'm going to tell you, one of the things I say, uh, um, quote Peterson, you better know a whole lot more than what you're talking about. Well, you better know a whole lot more than what you're saying. So what that means is if I'm talking about a topic, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you at this level, but I've got all this underneath it that I understand about that topic. And, and that's why when you see presenters, and we've got some, man, we've got some fantastic presenters in our uh, uh, Behavioral Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. And you can watch these folks uh, talking about something and a question gets asked and they pull from that reservoir of knowledge and, and, and put together other. And, and it, that's when you see people presenting at a really high level. So are, is your team in a place where they can talk intelligently about PBIS? They can talk about it, not just parrot what's been said, but talk about it. And one of the ways we found that's really helpful um, is model schools. Now we've got our model schools. Um, we're, 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 you know, obviously with the pandemic, we're not exactly sure what that's going to look like coming into the fall. Um, but uh, we had our model schools uh, from last year. And one of the things we found um, was how wonderful it was for other schools to go visit our model schools, because it's one thing to sit in the Academy, watch some videos, uh, you know, hear us talk about it. It's another thing to walk through a hall, talk to a principal, talk to a teacher, uh, talk about that journey and the struggles and things like that. So we found that's a great way for teams to deepen their knowledge and in order to take something back uh, to their team. Another thing we found is coaching is real effective. Now, back before we had the Reese's, we had coaches that were housed out of Reese's. Now we ask schools and counties to think about what coaching resources do you have? Our behavior support specialists, because we only have four for the whole state, they can't obviously be a day in day out coach for all schools in all West Virginia. It's just not mathematically possible, but we can be another set of eyes that comes in, come to a team meeting, look at an action plan, join on an online meeting, something like that. And that stuff can be really helpful. Getting that coaching in place, getting that uh, someone who's been down the road who can help uh, you know when something's coming. Another thing that I think is really important is are we doing staff assessment surveys? Are we asking people, and this is where that trans theoretical stages of change stuff comes in, are we doing a good job of seeing where people are in their understanding of the problem and readiness towards strategies and solutions? Um, that'll be really helpful, and I encourage people to do that early before they get into all kinds of extra stuff, even before traditional professional development because it'll help you tailor your professional development. Now, what you may end up doing is doing like a pre-needs assessment or pre-assessment and then do traditional professional development and then do a follow-up assessment to see if that moves people in the change process. Sounds complicated, but it's effective. It's not that have to be complicated. It can be built pretty easily, um, but it's getting a sense of are we moving toward that mindset shift, which then sets the stage for strategy development. And then we can do things like online learning. You know, there's tons and tons of PBIS videos and stuff like that. We have the WVPBIS.org website. We, I mean, we got tons of stuff. If you're the EC stuff, 
We've got the, our technical assistance there. We just got a, we got a lot of awesome stuff going. We now have a YouTube channel, um, so people can watch some of our stuff there. Um, and also, uh, the, not minimizing the importance of one-on-one conversations. You know, I, I found this to be a really good way to sit down and and tell people. You know, ask me a tough questions. You know, if you don't, if you're thinking this isn't going to be a good fit. Ask me tough questions. Ask me what's uh, what, what what you're worried about. What you what issues you have with this. The fourth one, the next to last one, and we have one more and we'll get wrapped up, is teaching systems. Teaching systems are probably one of the things we see people struggle with because they do them at the beginning of the year and then they're done. So they teach kids what it means to be successful in August, September, and then they punish any infraction of not meeting that expectation from that on. And this word will get you in trouble, especially middle schools and high schools struggle with this should. Should know how to walk down a hallway. You should know how to do this. You should know how to do that. One of the examples I used to like to use with I like to use with middle school uh, and high school folks is, uh, oh well, that's for they'll say that's for preschool. You shouldn't have to reteach and reteach. Listen, the best example of teaching systems is the military. The military has very specific ways. They when you show up, the military doesn't care where you're from. They don't care your race. You don't care how much money you had. The military looks at you and says, I assume you know nothing. I'm going to teach you how to stand. I'm going to teach you how to speak. I'm going to teach you how to take care of your stuff. I'm going to teach you how to walk, talk, all that stuff. And because they know that the most efficient way is to assume that everybody needs taught. Everybody needs that support. So even like when we're coming back in, especially at whatever coming back in is going to look like, those teaching systems are going to be huge. And just assuming kids should know how to come back to school is going to be at a huge detriment. Another mistake people make, is they try to motivate before they teach. Now, I'm going to speak to this quickly for time's sake. What people try to do is create incentives, say, look, if you do these things well, uh, then you get this reward. Here's the problem. If you incentivize something before a person has skill, you frustrate them, and then you make them not want to produce effort. An example I always use, which is easy, is if you try to give me a basketball and you tell me to dunk a basketball and you say you're going to give me 100 bucks. I will want to dunk the basketball. I will not have a motivational problem, but I will have a skill problem because I can't dunk a basketball. And then, but if you don't know that and then you try to increase the motivation, you take it to $200, but I still have the same level of skill. Now what you've done is you take that excitement and it turns into shame, disappointment, anger. I don't like basketball. I don't like uh, LeBron James. I don't like any of that. Why? Because it reminds me of what I wanted, but I couldn't get. That's why I put those parties and stuff out there first before strong teaching systems can actually work against kids from a behavioral motivation standpoint. I'll just say these real quick. Always be willing to reevaluate your expectations. We know it's three to five positively stated expectations for all people in all environments. What we found sometimes is people are so will, so wanting to hang on to an old set of expectations, an old set of something they built five, 10 years ago that they already have posters for that they don't get the best possible expectations for all people in all environments. You know, we have our examples. They're all over our website that you can see. So making sure, reevaluating your expectations always and making sure, do the, are these the best we can come up with? Um, an activity I encourage people to do, and this will be a good activity when we look at returning, our setting analysis, uh, great activity we've done in a variety of schools. Put, I put the uh, name of the environment on, stick, on post-it paper, post them all over like a gym or some sort of environment. Uh, and then it looks like this. In one qu- one section, it says, what do we want? Another section, what works? What are our inconsistencies and what are our challenges? And we have our staff move around in groups and write on these things, what do we want on the playground? What's working on the playground? What are the inconsistencies we have as adults? What are the things we're not consistent from one duty to the next? And what are our challenges? These are things we don't have any control over, right? These are the things that we have to consider. Great activity when we start looking at building those teaching systems, building how we're going to have teaching systems is doing that setting analysis, walking. And this is a great place to problem solve with people. I, I, I dealt with this one time with a lunch duty. Uh, we, we had two lunch duties that were handling lunch duty differently. And it, it was a pretty contentious argument about, well, neither one of them wanted to change what they were doing. And I basically just got to the, to the conclusion of what's best for kids. Is it best for kids that you guys do whatever you like best? Or is it best for kids to have the same lunch routine from K2 to 3-5? Why should they relearn lunch? Because we can't, adults can't agree of, of how to do it. So that's an example of that. And then 
how we do in our teaching system. Are we identifying our areas, when we're going to teach, how we're going to teach? Uh, in a perfect world, in my mind, teaching systems, uh, the way I like it is you create your standard teaching times, which are going to be uh, like August, September, and then you're going to reteach again around the end of October and into November, which is like party central, right? Then you're going to reteach again in January when kids come back. Then you're going to reteach in, in the spring when the weather breaks because kids get all kinds of squirrely at that point. And then you might reteach again at the end. Those are your standard teach times. Doesn't matter. We're going to reteach at each one of those times. And then we have our database reteach times. Our dad is telling us we need to reteach the cafeteria. Our dad is telling us we need to reteach the playground. Um, you know, we've had a lot of one of our model schools, Colton Elementary, um, they did uh, what they call Paul's Days, Practice at Work, which is a reteach. I think Colton's actually doing a later webinar, I think. And I think one of our other um, uh, model schools um, is also doing, Lost Creek is doing a webinar. So they might talk about how some of that stuff works. Um, also, when we look at this, it's building in, you know, we talk a lot about it, Tier 2, Check In, Check Out, and our social and academic skills groups. Those are reteach opportunities. Those are skill development opportunities. We've got to be dialing in on those as to as a as a extension of our reteach systems or our teaching systems. Last but certainly not least is our feedback and acknowledgement systems. This is the one that we run into sometimes where fidelity gets to be a real challenge. Is people they go here first, which I just explained to you why that can actually be a detriment to behavioral outcomes to go here first. So we have people, they're like, all right, we're going to end in nine weeks. If you don't have any office discipline referrals, perfect attendance, your academics is on honor roll, blah, blah, blah. You get to go to the pizza, you get some pizza in a jump house, right? But one thing I will say, I, I do not suggest, and I'm very clear about that, I do not suggest that you put um, academics and attendance with your behavioral outcomes. I, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's effective. I think you've got to, and another thing is you've got to start looking at shortening your intervals. We know from behavioral theory, we know that tighter, the tighter the loop, the better. So behavior feedback, behavior feedback, behavior feedback. What a nine weeks party is behavior, 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 feedback way out here. And for our kids that have uh, significant behavioral challenges, they, they, will struggle and won't make it. How you know is the same kids go to the parties all the time. That's how you'll know. Um, so, and the other thing we talk a lot about is no cost. We love no cost reinforcers. We love pro-social reinforcers. Pro-social reinforcers are spending time with other kids. Other, we found that elementary kids love time with teachers. Middle school, high school kids love times with their peers. Using those things as really effective reinforcers is good. Short interval is also good. Now, what I want to mention this real quick uh, as I kind of move through this. Why reinforcing reinforcement systems are so important is you just can't hug your way into resilience. You have to – hugging is important. You got to feel safe. I got to feel safe, right? But I also have to feel effective. So when we talk about the rational optimist, this is actually from Sean Acord, and this idea of what is optimism. Optimism is not the glass empty – the glass is half empty, half full. Optimism, true optimism is – Effort equals outcome. What reinforcement systems do is they teach kids effort outcome. It gives you feedback. Just like punishment, punishment is a feedback system. Punishment is, I, I did this, I got this feedback, I want to think about my, my, my behavior differently the next time. So what we look at feedback systems, why they are so important, right? Is I'm going to teach you something and then I'm going to give you feedback when you meet that, when you meet that expectation and how important those kinds of things are. And I somewhat joking, but honestly, I, I think it's the best way to teach it is I call it Lloyd's theory, right? From the great philosopher, Lloyd Christmas. And at the end of Dumb and Dumber, when he says to Mary Swanson, he asks, or he asks Mary Swanson, he's been following around a whole movie, what's the chances we're going to end up together? And Mary Swanson looks at him and says, not good. And he says like one in a hundred. And she says like more like one in a million. And Lloyd Christmas looks at her and says, so you're telling me there's a chance. And I just love that because that's the psychology of people who feel effect. I, you tell me there's a chance. We got, we got kids living in tough, tough circumstances. And they need the belief psychologically and behaviorally that there's a chance that their behavior matters. There's a chance that they have different outcomes. Because um, we can't fix a lot of things for a lot of kids. We can't make their parent recover from addiction. We can't, um, you know, we can't increase their IQ to 120 instantaneously. Um, we, we have to create ways where they start to believe in behavior. So the wrap up is 
The question is, are we doing the best we can to support behavior and social emotional growth in our students? This should be a driving question for your teams. This should be the things you should be considering and you should be moving toward this idea of when it's, you know, it's good versus great or good enough. You know, I had a, a professor one time he told me, Oh, you're, you're going to be a good one. You're not going to be a great one, but you're going to be a good one. And I, that's just, I'm summarizing the story very quickly, but what he, then I asked him, I said, well, what if I want to be, what if I want to be great at my, my work? And he said, in order to be great at it, you had to forget you were ever good. And that's really stuck with me. And I think that's something you guys really got to think about when we're implementing is good enough will be the hindrance of next level type activities. And we found that teams that are effective challenge themselves with this question, challenge themselves with study and research, and they revise and regroup and they fall down and they get back up. They shoot and ladders, right? You fall down, you get back up. Guess what? We, we just learned a ton about ourselves by what didn't work. And we learned a lot about what schools that are effective is they have that want to. They continue. And Alicia and uh, we were on a call the other day, and Alicia and we were talking about the idea that it's that want to, that, that momentum of moving toward what's hard and moving toward what those struggles might be. So a lot of content really fast. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully some of it made sense. And uh, just you know, we're talking about making things a little bit better. I'll tell you, we got some great, great content coming out this month with the webinars. We've got some great uh, stuff already up on the YouTube page. So, uh, Alicia, thanks for uh, having me on here. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Harris. We appreciate your knowledge and your willingness to share it with everybody. Um, and we thank you all for attending. I did just share the link that would be considered the sign in if your county is going to be looking for proof of um, proof of attendance. If you'll fill out that survey link and that will also give us some of our own feedback so we can improve. I just saw that there was a question about a recording. Our hope is that we will have this up to our YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to guess it will be in the next 24 hours. We will also link it on our social media. So if you would all go and follow us on WVPBIS on Facebook, and then uh, we also just started a YouTube channel, which you can search for WV space BMHTAC and subscribe to that. You will get access to all the videos we've been putting up and all the webinars that will be coming up in the month of June. Um, also, if you are interested or needing technical assistance, you can go to www.marshall.edu slash B-M-H-T-A-C. I'll put that in the chat or maybe um, Tiffany or Jen or Tara or Amy can put it in the chat real quick so you can follow assistance. Um, Jim showed a slide. Our next webinar for this webinar series will be on Tuesday. School Powell will be presenting to us, and he is a school psychologist from Morgan County. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Please share the information and share the links, and we um, are looking forward to continuing this series. Thank you for your time, um, and let us know if you have any questions for us. Have a great day, everybody.